Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, you know, for those of you who were here last year, uh, this is a follow-up to last year's talk that we had and debate that we had. Last year we focused and laid a lot of groundwork on the Snowden disclosures as well as what the NSA and the intelligence community is and is not doing. Um, I'm going to try and run through the intro and overview very quickly so that we can just jump into um, what we plan to talk about now uh, or for this session which is the USA Freedom Act, which is an act that Congress passed over the summer to fix um, one of the many programs that we've learned about. So the intro, I'm Mark Jaycox. I uh, do the legislative affairs for the Electronic Frontier Foundation on the civil, liberty, civil liberties and privacy side. I uh, focus on surveillance, user privacy, um, some national security stuff, um, as well as email privacy law. I'm, I'm a Jamil Jaffer. Uh, I just recently left uh, the government. I was working at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, before that, I worked at the House Intelligence Committee where I uh, did NSA oversight, uh, worked on um, uh, cyber intelligence sharing legislation, and prior to that, worked at the Justice Department and the White House, also working on uh, surveillance matters uh, and the like. So. Cool. Um, and so what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about primarily two things. I think you know I'll, we will definitely mention some of the newer NSA activities that we learned about, but we will be focusing more so on the USA Freedom Act and you know what it did, uh, did it do anything, does Congress ever do anything, um, and you know if it was a good or bad law, or somewhere in between. Um, so a quick overview for those of you who uh, you know, do, may not know what the USA Freedom Act is or what it does. And so this was a bill uh, that passed Congress over the summer. It deals with the Verizon order that we saw. This was an order where the government was using Section, uh, section 215 of the Patriot Act to collect uh, Americans' domestic calling records. The calling record, the order was sent to various telco companies, and then they were mandated to hand over the daily calling, calling records, our daily calling records, Americans' daily calling records. Um, what the bill does is mainly just three things. The first thing it does is it introduces, it stops that program, um, right? It mandates that when the government does search or when the government does file an order under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, they have to name what's defined in the bill as a specific selection term. Um, there's some debate as to what can and cannot be a specific selection term, but it introduces this idea that the government can't just say, um, as they were, uh, all Americans calling records are relevant to an investigation and we want them. Um, the second thing it does is it introduces an amicus into uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, which is a surveillance court that was established in 1978 uh, when, they, when Congress first passed a lot of these foreign intelligence laws. Um, and what it does is that court, uh, that court operates in D.C. There are rotating judges on it, and they review the orders sent over um, and filed by the government under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, what it, the bill does is it, it does not mandate, um, but it strongly encourages the FISA court that they should be including an adversary uh, when an argument is novel, when there's a new use of a technology, um, when there's a core constitutional issue, and when key terms in uh, the USA Freedom Act are being interpreted in new ways or different ways. The third thing it does is it introduces transparency, right? Uh, the FISA court is infamous for, or was infamous for not disclosing orders, for being highly secretive, um, and for being, a, a, for being a rubber stamp. We've seen a lot of the numbers of the orders modified, deleted, it's, it's a very low percentage. Um, that's reflective also sometimes of the FISA court system, uh, where some of the orders do not go you know, straight to the judge. There are advisors who sometimes look at, it, look at those orders, but it's mainly been you know, seen as a rubber stamp. And the third thing the USA Freedom Act does is it introduces transparency requirements, reporting requirements. So the government uh, now has to require uh, the number of orders, uh, the number of customer accounts that may be affected, and the like, um, as well as uh, not just the USA Freedom Act doesn't just allow for the US government reporting, it also allows companies to report in, in these wide bands. You know, it's something. We fought for a very narrow uh, band. We would like to see companies report, you know, I've received 21 NSLs. But what the USA Freedom Act does is, is does it in bands. Uh, oh, and NSLs are national security letters, a form of process under uh, the law where the government can get, uh, does get business records and the like. Um, and so what it does is it does these wide bands, so 0 to 100, 0 to 500, um, every six months. 
And so those are the main three big things that the bill does. Um, and that provides a very quick overview of that. Uh, after that, I'm going to just jump into you know what I think, and then I think Jamil's going to respond. Um, we're right on time, which is nice. And then we'll open it up for questions because uh, you know I think last year a lot of people. Uh, it is so. It is rare, I think, to get two very opposite people up on stage together to talk about these things. I mean, sometimes it happens, but it is often not colloquial. Um, it's often. Uh, not as friendly, I guess I should say. So I think questions you know, for you guys to ask, uh, both of us, is really vital. So just jumping into it, um, the USA Freedom Act, uh, is it good, is it bad? You know, EFF supported the USA Freedom Act up until around uh, when the Second Circuit, uh, ACLU, brought a case against the Section 215 program, the business records program. And we did support the bill up until that point. Um, we thought that the bill, and we still think the bill is a small step, um, but it's an important step. Uh, we've seen internet activists, we've seen you know, a lot of the uh, pro-privacy actors and civil society organizations kill bad bills, right? You know, we've, we killed SOPO, we have been killing for the past few years the cybersecurity bills, although we'll see on that. Um, you know, we have been killing a lot of these very privacy invasive bills, or bills that we think are very privacy invasive. A big step for, I think, privacy advocates and privacy organizations is passing that bill, right? It showed that you can have a very cohesive, organized, sustained campaign uh, over two years, right? The, work on that bill and work to reform at least this one program of the NSA started essentially after Ed Snowden released his disclosures. So you had a sustained, coordinated campaign and you actually got something through Congress. So I think that's it's a, it's a big step for privacy advocates, um, but you have to look at that and you have to, you know, look at the other side of the coin and say, look, the step is small. It, admittedly, it's a, it's a small step, but I think it's a step that's going to build. Um, it's going to build, hopefully, for further reform. Another one of these programs, the law that authorizes one of these programs, is Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendments Act, and that you know that is a welcomed fight in 2017 about what's going to happen to that law. So, you know, I think where we come from is that it is good um, that it is a small step um, and also that it is very important to have a bill that narrows the power of the intelligence community. This is the first time that's happened since they kind of, since they wrote the original law in 1978. Um, and that's, I, I think, a good feat. It's a big feat. And mandating that the government has to be specific, right? We, we won't stand for the government filing very broad blanket orders collecting our information, American information. Um, and so I think the standard that the USA Freedom Act places on the government and, and mandates a much narrow search um, and a particular search is really important. Um, the second thing I think is also important are the institutional changes. Um, the FISA court suffers from a lot of problems, right? You had the Washington Post write an article uh, quoting the former FISA court judge saying, look, we can't really regulate this stuff. We rely on the NSA to notify us when something goes wrong, and we try and investigate. So you know, I think the institutional changes in USA Freedom where the court is going to have an amicus in there, right? This is not just going to be a one-sided court anymore, um, as well as the opinions will be released. So if the bill works, we should not have a significant opinion like the, the secret Verizon order or the secret, inter secret law, secret interpretations of section 215 kept in the closet. Um, you know, the bill says if it's novel, if it's significant, if there's a constitutional issue, it has to be released. And so those are, you know, I think a, a very quick overview of you know, what, what I think about USA Freedom, what we think about USA Freedom and, and the good that's there, but also you know, looking at the other side of the coin and, and looking at the marginal and, and small step that it did make. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I think you know I think there are, there are uh, a few challenges with USA Freedom. I think the, the biggest one, the most obvious one, is look. We were here last year talking about NSA surveillance, and the week that we were at the conference, um, our the U.S. began attacking ISIS um, in Iraq and and uh, and eventually Syria. Um, in part because ISIS presents a national security threat to the United States. Uh, they've taken over a significant amount of land. We're now now a year later, and the threat from ISIS um, is growing. Uh, if you believe the FBI director, and there are, I know a lot of people are very skeptical of the, of the uh, national security structure of our government, but if you believe uh, the FBI director, Jim Comey, um, he says that ISIS is talking to hundreds, if not thousands of Americans in the United States um, about uh, trying to encourage them to become radicalized, encourage them to use 
uh, uh, encrypted methods of communication to communicate with ISIS and, uh, and to undertake attacks uh, here in the United States as lone wolves. Um, and so, so the, the threat, at least as perceived by the government, as described by the FBI, is growing. And uh, the USA Freedom Act takes one tool, uh, and there's questions about, the, about how significant and how valuable a tool it is, but takes one tool off the table at a time when other governments around the world, including in some of our allies in Great Britain and the like, are actually increasing their own domestic uh, surveillance authorities, um, as well as their ability to, for example, uh, revoke the citizenship of their own citizens who go to fight with ISIS. And so it's an interesting dynamic where in the United States we're taking steps to limit uh, what the government is doing um, as a result of uh, some of the disclosures that have, that have taken place, while other countries are actually moving in the exact opposite direction in response to the threat environment. I think the other piece about the USA Freedom Act that I think is, is interesting and challenging for privacy advocates, I think this is part of why I think you have supported the bill, but ultimately, you know, sort of, and I think it's, it's, thinks it's favorable, but, you know, I think there are reasons to think there are problems with the USA Freedom Act, and one of the reasons is um, what it does is it actually entrenches uh, the, the notion that the government can and should be collecting some amount of metadata and looking at it, and it puts in place a procedure for the government to repeatedly go back to providers and obtain the data. This all assumes the data is going to be there at the providers, which one of the, one of the key flaws from a government's perspective in the USA Freedom Act is it doesn't require the providers to keep the data. And so whereas before the government would go to the providers and say, okay, now every day or every week or every month, you've got to provide us the last 30 days of data, and then the government would hold it for X amount of time, a year or two, whatever the amount of time was, now it has to go to the carriers when it has uh, you know, an order for a given specific identifier, and there's a real, real chance the provider simply won't keep it. Right? Now there are business reasons to keep records, but a lot of those are largely going away. I mean, when was the last time you checked your phone bill um, and looked at all the numbers uh, that you dialed, right? It used to be back in the day, I'm old enough to remember when we billed for interlata calls, right? So you call long distance, you got an extra bill uh, or a more expensive bill. Uh, phone companies don't really bill that way anymore, uh, by and large. And so as a result, um, there's, no, there's less of a business reason to keep the records. And now they'll be under pressure from groups like EFF and the privacy community to not retain the records so the government uh, can't get them. And so, so uh, people's privacy is more protected in that sense. And so there's a real question about whether data will be there. But if the data is there, you've now got a completely clear program. Uh, whereas before under 215, it was unclear. Could the government really get this data? The Second Circuit said, look, it doesn't comply with the statute. When you say we're going to get all the records, now there's a methodology and Congress is explicitly endorsed the notion of collection of large amounts of metadata, albeit using specific identifiers, um, of, of American cell phone records without the need for a, for a full-blown warrant. Um, and so that's, a, that's I think, it, from a privacy perspective, is, is one of the challenges uh, that USA Freedom poses for the, for the privacy community. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that is somewhat right. I mean, a couple of things. I think the, the tool on the table is something that we have all gone back on, you know, with the intelligence community, uh, with the government. You know, what we have right now is we had a, a, re, a, re, a review group, excuse me, by the president. Um, we also had an independent executive agency called the Privacy, Civil Liberties, and Oversight Board say that the program wasn't effective. Um, you know, we had also about three hearings, too, in front of the Judiciary Committee where the metric admittedly is how many attacks did this stop. And we've gotten zero. Uh, the one thing we do know Section 215 was used for was a material support case where this person, uh, I believe in San Diego, sent over uh, $3,500 um, to, uh, I think, T uh, this terrorist group in the Middle East. And so, you know, I think at least on the effectiveness, we haven't heard, we haven't really heard the intelligence community say, well, this is incredibly vital because it has stopped attacks, or it's incredibly vital because we are using it to even social chain people, right? I, I think that the argument of is it effective or not has, has been settled, at least by the review groups and by the PCLB. Um, so I think I would like, you know, if that is going to be an argument, metrics or methodologies, and the intelligence community hasn't shown us that, right? So or the, have so, they? Well, I mean, I, look, I mean, I think that the, the, the FBI and the, and the DNI put out a, put out a document that, that showed nine, nine separate uh, convictions, not convictions, but uh, uh, acts that they stopped, right? So, they, they, and so they've laid out a case, they made a case for it. You know, a lot of people have disagreements about whether that's a, a legit case or not. But they've laid that out, and they've also said that, you know, it stopped attacks in, in, in dozens of countries around yeah. the world, not just the U.S. Um, and look, this, but the thing to remember about this type of collection, metadata collection, is this is not going to be a silver bullet. Metadata is never going to tell you this person is going from point A to point B and going to conduct an attack. That's just not its use. It's, it's confirmatory. It's helpful. It helps you identify what people are communicating with whom. It helps you identify a network. Um, you know, the yeah. link analysis, right, that we now can talk about and that, that's done is a key part of that. But it's never going to be a silver bullet. It's never going to be that stops a terrorist attack. 
but it's intelligence collection. Intelligence collection is about taking dozens of pieces of information, putting them together, and seeing if you can figure out what's happening, right? Um, you know, the 9-11 Commission report said, look, part of the problem was we didn't have all the puzzle pieces and we didn't connect them up well. We didn't share information, we didn't work, we didn't work as, a, as a collective government to know what everybody else knew and put it together to put the pieces together. And so, you know, Medit has one small piece of that, and it's, it's, it's never going to be the case that somebody's going to say, okay, look, here, there's 215 prior, stop this terrorist attack. Now, that being said, the government has, but so the Colorado case, right, yeah. with the, with, uh, the Najibul Zazi traveling mm -hmm. from Colorado to New York, the subway attack, in that case, uh, the 215 program was used, uh, again, as confirmatory evidence. They already had uh, a thought that Zazi was involved, and it, was, it confirmed his connections with the phone calls he was making to other members of his network. And so um, that confirmed that, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't silver bullet. Well, I think, so there are two things that Jimmy had touched on. I, I, one is the interpretation of the 9-11 Commission report, right? I think that it's not that the intelligence community didn't have tools. It's that the intelligence community failed to put them together, right? The information was there. Uh, the information wasn't shared. Um, uh, the, the FISA wall was blamed for a lot of that. But I think, you know, at least what, what Jamil is bringing out is the fact that when we read the 9-11 Commission report, we think it says that the information was there. It was not about a lack of tools, right? It was not about the inability to collect um, all of our calling records to try and chain them against a prospective attack. It was that CIA did have some information on the plotters in Yemen. FBI did have some information on domestic people uh, taking kind of these fighter cl uh, pilot classes and, and sketchiness around that. So I think that you know that's one thing. I'd also just step back on the efficiency because I think that. I think something that is going to be very important is getting methodology and metrics. It's something that we've been pushing for because right now everything is behind closed doors and classified and the American public doesn't know, the American public doesn't know, you know, how effective these programs are. When, we, when I see a mass collection of Americans' domestic calling records and then, you know, two independent commissions say this actually isn't very useful to stopping terrorist attacks, it leaves a huge question into, well, you know, why are we doing this? And is it, where's the cost, right? What it, there's a huge privacy cost in knowing, in having the NSA or any intelligence community know that, you know, I called my dad about the Yankees last night. And I don't think we saw that cost benefit analysis at all. Um, I think it came far too late. Um, and it's, it's pretty egregious, right? It's an egregious collection for at least an outcome that is minimal. Um, on the revoking citizenship, Snowden's passport was taken away. So, I mean, I mean, so, so, look, if, he, if, US if, if, Ed Snowden, if Ed Snowden wants to come back to the United States, hallelujah, we'll, we'll welcome him back, we'll, we'll try him in federal court, we'll see how it goes, right? I mean, you know, we're, the, the U.S. government would love to have Edward Snowden come back to the United States and stand, and, you know, they would uh, well, make him stand in court. We'll see about that. But uh, on the point of, I think it's a, it's a valid point. I mean, he's hiding out in Moscow right now. I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, come on. Um, I think it's a valid point that there are other advancements in countries on the other side of surveillance, right? That we've seen in France and we've seen in Britain these intelligence laws that are actually expanding powers, whereas in the U.S. we actually have the USA Freedom Act. Yeah. But just on the note of, you know, what the U.S. is and is not doing on, on citizenship and things like that, um, on the entrenching metadata program, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, the, I think a question that we all ask is, would a different program exist, right? Um, you had the Second Circuit essentially say that this was, this, falls outside of the statute. They didn't touch the constitutional issues, right? They, they focus purely on if the statute does or does not allow it. And I think the, the question you know, I always ask myself is, would there have been another similar program? Um, and does that mean that we do need to reform the law? Does that mean that we did need to introduce this idea where the government has to pick a specific selection term? Um, and is it sufficiently narrow, right? We try to ensure that it is sufficiently narrow by including negative clauses, these things in bills that, that describe what it cannot be, um, as well as describing uh, narrow categories, right, of what it could be. So, you know, that's how, that's how we try to attack that problem. Um, and on the issue of the data won't be there, I, th I think that's up in the air, right? There are current, current, so the United States doesn't have a formal uh, data mandate, right? We don't have a, we don't have a formal data mandate. There's, there, is, there are regulations that mandate the uh, keeping of calling records for 18 months uh, for landline phones. Long distance for Toll landline records, phones. I mean, you know. Yeah, for landline phones. Yeah. Um, so we have that there. Uh, Who still has a landline, by the way? You know, right, I mean, right, very few people have landlines. <laughs> no, right? my okay. parents have landlines <laughs> still. My parents, <laughs> and no, and no call waiting, which is ridiculous. Like, what, I get a busy signal. Are you kidding me? 
Um, so I think like, the question of if the data, if the data will be there, yeah. is a big question. I think the relationships, you know, what we've seen from the documents and and what I think the everyday American views when they see the relationship between a lot of these large corporations and the government is that I think it will be pretty rare when I think it'll be pretty rare if the corporation just completely you know goes to a zero knowledge setup right I I think that it, that will be rare and what it does is it favors the court order process right it favors legal process and I think that is what we're searching for yeah. and what we need in any of this, right? If you're going to have any collection, it's got to be under a very strict legal process, a constitutional legal process. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, look, a healthy skepticism of government surveillance is something we should all have, right? And we all probably do have. I mean, it's, it's, the, it, it's, it's the way our country began. The Fourth Amendment is a core uh, protection against government, uh, against government intrusion into your private life. And so it's important to be skeptical of government surveillance. It's important, it's important to question these programs and ask why they're being done. Is the, is the cost benefit, is the cost worth the benefit? Uh, you get and you know and look your miles may vary and as you point out a couple of government panels have determined that the, the trade off wasn't worth it. Um, of course, the, the government itself did defend the program uh, and said it was worth it. And I would note that the Obama administration continued after the Snowden revelation didn't stop the program right up till the minute that that the USA Freedom Act was passed. They continued the program. Well, maybe 24 hours before they slowed it down, right? And then the minute that the USA Freedom Act passed, they restarted the program. And so, you know, clearly the government, right, and, and, and this administration, which obviously, you know, um, forget what you think about the Bush administration, right, where I worked, um, you know, this administration, which purports to be more privacy protective and the like, believes there's some value, right, even though their own panels question value. And so, um, you know, it's important to be skeptical. It's important to try and find a path forward um, on, on how you protect privacy uh, consistent with you know the, the need of the government and the, the need you want to have your government protect your not your security right it's an important part I mean, to the extent you believe the government should have limited powers that's probably the one power you want them to have which is to protect your own security right that's the one core thing you expect the federal government to do for you and so the question of where that trade-off I think is a key one and if, if nothing else there has been a benefit to this debate, right? And the cost-benefit debate in Congress, right, it resulted in the passage of legislation that ultimately doesn't get rid of the program completely, which I think would have been the preference of a lot of activists, right? But it enshrines a program in a much more limited scope down way. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd push back on that and say it does get rid of the bulk collection programs, mm. right? It gets rid of the programs where the government does not have a particular name, does not have a particular, you know, item, person, thing. Right, right. So, I, and I think that is that it was not the ultimate goal for that legislation. I think that was one of those goals. I think there was right the passing of that bill essentially acknowledges both on the government end because they you had different government entities say different things, but you did have the president support the bill. You had the DNI support uh, the director of national intelligence support the bill as well as the NSA chief. Um, and I think that begrudgingly, <laughs> begrudgingly, I think they well, they wrote a lovely letter that supported the bill. Um, Noted the potential problems with and, and the challenges it might pose to national security, but did say it would continue necessary operations and that it would not con contribute or harm national security. Um, and so I think that's one of the questions of uh, it does end these programs, right? And you know I have no doubt that there probably were very similar programs. We have reports from Charlie Savage at the New York Times saying that there was potentially a similar program with financial records. So I think that it kind of does, it does delete, to delete, excuse me, it does get rid of those programs, um, these bulk collection programs. And the debate is, the true debate, and I think what we're both touching on, touching on is how narrow is specific yeah. selection term? Like how, yeah. how narrow is the, is the collection? And you know, I think that for a lot of people who follow, you know, where the individual, individual privacy organizations were, right, there was a split on the USA Freedom Act where you, you had some privacy organizations support the bill and some privacy organizations not support the bill and a lot of it hinged on how you interpret a specific selection term um, and how narrow of the records do you think the government could get with it and you know that is a it's a key term in the bill um, and we will see how the FISA court interprets it um, and how it how it gets and how it develops so look I think we should take questions yeah. and by the way so we're, we're happy to talk about any aspect of government surveillance we don't need to limit it to the 215 metadata program we're happy to talk about content surveillance yep. 702 um, uh, collections outside the United States so um, if people want to ask questions, we'd love to take them and, uh, and we can continue to go back and forth, but <laughs> how about we fight in front of you guys? <laughs> All right, questions. Government surveillance, yeah. Well, you want, maybe you want to come up to yeah, the microphone the mic. over here? Yeah, I think that's best. We can repeat the questions too if you, sure. if it's uh, too a couple loud. Of, couple of questions actually. Uh, one, the, about the surveillance of calls, uh, the telephone records. Uh, is the law clearly states like a traditional cell phone 
calls from these fixed line providers like or does it also apply or is there any ambiguity around calls made using non-traditional like voice or IP systems? Yes, so, uh, so I think, I mean, I think the law, I think one of the arguments the government made for why they were supportive of the law was that it in some ways expanded what they, what they believe they could get uh, because it expanded to all forms of communication beyond sort of what, what the 250 program had traditionally used for. And so I think the government's looking to get more under the new USA Freedom Program than they did under the 215 program. That I don't think. I, that's an interesting question. I don't think so. Um, when it comes to call records, call records are defined. So the definition of call records is defined quite narrowly. The definition of call records, it has to be um, either a person, a place, or it has to be a person, an individual, actually an individual, excuse me, not a person because obviously the whole corporate people or persons right. thing. It can't be an entity. So yeah, it cannot be an entity. It has to be an individual person. Um, it has to be an individual. So. The call records for call records, it's quite narrow. I think it's but the I think other about, tangible about like, records. Yeah, like IP. So it depends. Uh, the answer is it depends on the term that they're using, right? Uh, they can use a temporarily assigned network address, um, but if they're collecting too much, the court will not. The court isn't supposed to allow it. Um, also, that question if it does come up, should be public. That, I think that's a question that hits spot on on how you interpret the terms that are going to be used and how the government is interpreting the terms. So your question, I think, speaks exactly to the transparency requirements in the bill. We should, if there is uh, an order using uh, an IP address or using a temporary network address and it's quite broad or it's a new application um, or significant in any way, we will know. Okay. But under, but, you know, to be clear, under the under the 215 program that the government that you know we, we learned about, the government was collecting phone records. Now under USA Freedom, they will have the the, the law does permit a broader scope. And it goes beyond call records, right? Well, it, it always went. Point. Yeah, I would say though, it always went beyond call records, right? You had in the statute, the statute. Oh, the statute, right? The statute subsumes yeah. all tangible things, right? But the way they were using it okay, in this program, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yes. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, if they expand it to say more like a communication, then you know it gets into totally different, much broader spectrum of data right. because communication can be anything. Right. And remember again, we're talking about just the, just the metadata. fact, just metadata, just the fact of the communication, not the content, right? Not the content. The okay. content comes under separate separate authorities. Uh, yeah. The, my next question is about the actual content. So, yeah. how does the existing law or the that specific Freedom Act applies to the internet traffic or the internet patterns? Does any of that apply, or is it too broad, or do we have any clarity on that? So, we, yeah, I mean, we will have very different interpretations. You can go first. Yeah, so I think, I mean, look, historically, um, the, the FISA law, right, uh, defined communication by the type of technology used and where the people were located. And so, um, uh, FISA is what generally applies to the surveillance of Americans' communications today, even. Um, and uh, there's the FISA Amendments Act, which deals with surveillance of foreigners who are located outside the United States, and there the collection is much broader and uh, more widely authorized. Now, in that collection, you will get the collection of American communications with those foreigners overseas who are targeted, and you'll get the content of those communications. Uh, but for an American, no matter where they're located in the world, whether in the United States or outside the United States, you have to go get a court order based on probable cause to believe, in, in the foreign intelligence context, to believe that they're a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power, essentially a spy or a terrorist. Um, or, or that you have a criminal court order, uh, you believe a reasonable, probable cause to believe a crime has been committed. So you have a, essentially what amounts to a Fourth Amendment warrant or a very similar analog yeah. uh, to warrant it. Warrant light, I call a warrant, it warrant light. Warrant light, because yeah, it's not in the foreign intelligence context. Yeah, That's in right. the foreign intelligence context, yeah. right? Uh, I, so you know, right? The item that Jamil hops over is, is Section 702 in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendments Act. And, this is, as I said, we're going to have very different interpretations of it because 702, you know, EFF is, is dealing with, liti it has litigated against the NSA on Section 702. Um, it is intended to target foreigners and it is intended for foreign collection, but what we're seeing and what was released uh, actually by the FISA court is that there is a tremendous amount of Americans' content being sucked in on those searches um, and by those searches and that we're, you know, we think that there are certainly constitutional protections that should be in play, that there should be a higher legal standard for that statute because of the fact that 
you know, we hear the government often say that we don't target Americans. We hear the government say that this is just on foreign collection. Well, it's illegal. The law actually bars targeting Americans under, the, under that law. But the law also allows for a tremendous amount of incidental collection. But of that's American always true. Every kind of but every kind of surveillance, right? So, so you get a traditional warrant, right, from a court. And you're, I, I tap your phone, right? I have probable cause to believe you're a criminal, right? I'm going to get your communications with everybody else, right? I mean, that's, I mean, you guys have all seen, we talked about this last year, but you've all seen um, in Casino, right, where uh, we're in Vegas, so it's, we're talking about Casino, you know, where the, where the wives get on the phone, they're talking about, you know, whatever, just regular business, so the FBI drops off the line, and then, and then the guys get on the phone and they're having their, their talk about, about the mafia business. Um, look, the, the, the government is always playing this game of, you know, um, uh, collecting, unintentionally collecting information um, that, that isn't relevant to the thing. And so in the case of Americans, we do, we do the same thing in the foreign intelligence context. We minimize the data. Now, we don't do it the same way that we do in the criminal context. We don't turn, the, turn the, the wiretap on or off. What we do is we redact out Americans' information um, when it's collected. If it's not foreign intelligence, you don't keep it. Um, you, have to, you have to keep, you, only you can keep it as if it's foreign intelligence information, and you can only unredact the information if it's relevant to understand that foreign intelligence information. So there are protections, but it's a different kind of minimization. It's a, well, the thing is, it's a very different kind of minimization, mm -hmm. right? In the example, in the casino example, you had a warrant that was specific, detailed, who you're spying on, what you aim to get, as well as being reviewed by a judge, right? When it comes to Section 702, what we see is certifications that judges don't see and are sent over to internet service providers. Well, they, they see, they so, see, the, they see the, the sort they of see bucket, the broad category, broad, broad right? What the, We're targeting terrorists overseas. What the judge sees right. is, a, is the targeting procedures, which, mm -hmm. uh, which have been disclosed. So they, those have actually been disclosed by the government. So we, we can all kind of talk about that. And those are, are these very broad categories that are submitted to the gov to, excuse me to the government that are submitted to the FISA court. Um, you know the real issue is the certification process where um, you know the, the content that you, the fact that when you send off one of these certifications you're going to have a tremendous the the aperture of collection right in the casino example is going to be much smaller because you said sure. exactly who you're going to search for what you're searching for sure. what you want to get sure. what you aim to get and where you're going to even search. Whereas with 702, you know, we don't have many of those standards. We have a broad category. Um, we have a, uh, we think we're going to, the significant purpose, right? You know, we think we will get this. But beyond that, we don't really have a neutral and detached magistrate looking at the exact Individual. certification right. um, and the exact per, target. Per target, that's right. That's right. Um, so I think that's huge. The foreign intelligence one, I, you know, I... I don't know, so part of my job is reading a lot, of, a lot of these documents, right, in the policies and procedures of the government. Foreign intelligence, defined quite broadly. Um, in the procedures that, that Jamil is talking about, this, uh, you know, when you do collect too much, uh, you're supposed to redact or you're supposed to delete in some instances. You know, the, and we pointed, I pointed to this last year, right? There, there are two examples that I love pointing to. One is it allows for, the, the procedures allow for the retention of American communications for uh, a technical database reason. And the way, they the way technical database is defined is essentially like any maintenance or ability to you know, keep the data, right? It's like a, it's the, government use, the government doesn't use it that way. It's, it's an incredibly broad definition. The other one is encryption, right? Anything that is encrypted. There's no analysis. There's a, an assumption, essentially, that if you're using encryption, there's something sketchy going on. No, no, on. I think that, actually, I think the reason why that is, it just takes, if you're, if you're trying to, if, you're, if you think there might be, right, communication that you need to get to, or you, it's gonna take you time, right? If you're using brute force, or whatever methodology you're using, it's not, it's not instantaneous to. But the time is forever, so the, the right, the, for the encryption, the encryption, uh, uh, clause allows for forever. There's no time limit on when you can and cannot delete it. I mean, I think if you were able to show that the it wasn't an, an American's encrypted communications, I think you got, uh, you know, you might have an argument there. Yeah. But. Sorry. See, we could do this for forever. Um, my my question is, um, we with the uh, it's the Freedom Act, right? That's with the Freedom Act. We saw a lot of outcry from you know. Uh, Congress and things like that about uh, telecommunication records mm -hmm. being stored. But um, when the Snowden leak happened, there was a lot of other, even more um, privacy, uh, I guess you could call them violations. Um, and I'm just wondering why we haven't heard outcry on that from lawmakers. It's just, it's all, all about phone records. And my, uh, my second question is um, <clears throat> working in security, I, I see the value of mass collection of data and then trying to draw intelligence from it. Just wondering, 
each of your individual uh, philosophies on um, intelligence gathering. I, I can definitely see some value in pulling um, intelligence from surveillance, but at a certain point, you know, like I don't want the government looking at me through my cell phone camera or something like that. So, just thoughts there. Yeah, sure. Um, on the you, yeah, you don't mind if I go? No, well, please. Um, on the first one, uh, my answer. I've gotten that question a couple of times. I, my answer is that I think there are two answers. One is that Congress is fo is following the leaks. So you had Section Two Hundred and Fifteen come out. Congress was outraged. It took them two years to figure out what to, well, it took them two years to learn about it, right? Because some of the members were saying they didn't even know about it. Um, and then also figure out what to do about it. Um, I think what we're seeing is Congress trail behind the leaks, right? So after the uh, Verizon leak, you had a, a leak, a disclosure, a law uh, discussing Section 702 and what we've been talking about. And what we're seeing, or at least you know what I'm seeing at EFF when I talk to members and when I talk to their staff is that they're in an education, they have been in an education phase, right, probably for the past at least six or seven months trying to get a gra grasp on what is Section 702 and how uh, incredibly invasive, right, that it potentially is. Um, but that Congress is starting to look at Section 702 and that, you know, people are certainly ge getting geared up and trying to figure out what is going to happen when that law expires in 2017. Um, the other thing, the second answer and the second point I talk about is on the encryption, on some of the back doors, I mean, you have seen the House focus a lot more on it. I don't think I've seen the Senate, you know, when I, when I try to remember, I don't think I've seen the Senate really look too much into those issues. Maybe there are a couple of hearings, but in the House, what we've seen are, excuse me, what we've seen are bills being presented. We saw actually two amendments get attached to uh, the House uh, appropriations bills, uh, essentially, very vocally saying you should not have backdoors and technology products um, and things like that. So, you know, I think that it's there in the house. Um, do you want to answer that? No, I'll go. I'll talk, uh, so jumping into just, so it's another great question, that second question. You know, I think the core issue, if I were to really distill the core issue and the core problem, it's that after September 11th, we saw a shift, right? And that shift was from uh, targeted surveillance, particular surveillance, uh, a much more narrow, smaller aperture, morph into we need to collect it all, right? Uh, we need to make sure that we have so much information that we can run metrics on it, that we can figure out who is talking to who, um, all for a foreign intelligence purpose, but we know that that definition is quite broad. So, you know, I think that that is the huge shift, and, you know, my theory on it is that, my theory on it is that I think we've gone you know, far too wide, right? The, what we've seen from the disclosures, what we've seen from a lot of the court orders is just a massive amount of communications and data, um, and particularly of American communications, right? You know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna focus on uh, Americans' data solely because I, there are very strong arguments when the Constitution kicks in on that, right? I think it's, it's, it is admittedly harder to talk about foreigners. I think there are certain international law principles that the US you know, probably should follow uh, but has not signed on to. Um, but I think that that's, that is how I would distill what has happened. And what we need to do is, uh, you know, what's, what Snowden did is at least precipitate, he catalyzed a national conversation on some of these things. He didn't catalyze the conversation on all of these things, but at least we're talking about them. You know, at least the polls show that Americans now know what the third party doctrine is, right? You know, people are understanding what data they give over and how that's implicated with government surveillance as well as corporate surveillance, right? Where companies are also collecting a huge amount of data on us. Um, so I think that, you know, is, is my answer to that. It's that we should find a way and we can find a way because there is a way to cramp down and to narrow back the ability to search or the ability to collect all this information. We should have the confidence to uh, find a particular person. Uh, we should have the confidence to make sure that we don't have to suck everything up on a fiber optic cable, that we have covert agents doing work to make sure that we don't have to, that we have very narrowly targeted, uh, you know, potentially computer exfiltration stuff, or we have narrowly targeted programs and activities um, instead of this just massive on the wire. There's a guy over there. Did, did you have a question over there? Sorry. It, it, yeah. We can't see us. Yeah, Sorry. so I, I was actually just curious uh, when or if you think there will actually be an actual review through the courts of the constitutionality of these programs. 
So, so you know, the 215 program was, uh, you know, was reviewed by the Second Circuit, um, and they determined that it was, it didn't, it didn't meet the statutory requirement. They didn't address the constitutional issue. Um, there's going to be, there's litigation already ongoing about cell phone locational data. We were just talking about that earlier today when we were, when we were preparing for this. Um, look, the courts, have, the courts have considered a lot of these issues. We, we actually litigated the 702 program uh, with Yahoo um, in the FISA court um, in classified litigation that was ultimately declassified in 2009. 2008, we declassified the fact of litigation. The name of the provider was declassified after the Snowden leaks. Um, and we litigated that both in the FISA court itself as well as in the FISA court review in the second ever uh, case heard before that court. Um, in both cases, the government won that, uh, won that argument uh, that the collection was reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Um, even this broad, untarded collection that, that Mark is so concerned about that dr dramatically sweeps some of his American communications, the court ultimately determined it was reasonable. Now, it didn't go to the Supreme Court. It did not. Um, it was Yahoo, also three judges. What's that? Fisker, it was three? Fisker's That's right. Three judges. That's right. Three judges. But, of course, Yahoo could have sought en banc review by the, by the FISA court review. They didn't do that. Well, sorry, there's no en banc review. It's only a three-judge panel. You're right. Uh, but they could have sought Supreme Court review and chose not to, having lost you know, twice in pretty, in pretty, pretty clear opinions. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a very real possibility that could happen, um, and I think we'll see what happens. But, you know, the courts have generally given the government fairly broad leeway when it comes to national security surveillance, uh, particularly when Congress endorses it, right? And so Congress authorizes it, um, whether it's in the USA Freedom Act in a more limited form or in a broader form under 702. Uh, the court tends to give pretty, pretty broad leeway to intelligence collection. Um, two questions, actually. So um, the first one is that it seems like these uh, Western countries that you mentioned, uh, France, UK, United States, Australia, are passing these uh, sweeping domestic surveillance laws kind of because terrorism. Um, it, realistically, do you ever see a point where a Western administration would say, uh, you know what, terrorism isn't actually that much of a threat anymore, we can sunset um, these provisions? The first part. And the second part related is, uh, it seems like I'm hearing that the, that the metric being used to, to measure these or kind of weigh these programs is, well, if we can stop one terrorist attack, we should do it. And so um, almost, you know, every, all the cost is being weighed against, uh, would it, could it stop a terrorist attack or can we prevent a terrorist attack? And I think, Jamil, you even said that, um, well, these, um, the metadata programs wouldn't necessarily stop an attack, but they're helpful. So you know, wouldn't it be helpful if every American wore a camera and a microphone all the time? Um, and if that's the metric, like if we can stop one terrorist attack, then um, why wouldn't that be reasonable as well? Yeah, I mean, and that's exactly why you kind of have to step back from the efficacy model, right? Because uh, if it was efficacious to just tap all of our phones, the government would probably try and make an argument like that. Um, on the first one, uh, can there be a sunset? So the, pay the, the oddly enough, the Patriot Act did sunset for about 24 hours because Congress couldn't get its act together. Um, and so it did expire for a little bit and then it was rebooted. Um, so I think that there can be a sunset. I think that the, 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 what you point to is an issue, maybe the issue of our time, right? Uh, if you look at the number of prosecutions for terrorist related charges by the DOJ, it's, uh, in the annual report, it's always something like less than 1%, right? The DOJ is generally charging uh, almost uh, a majority of narcotics and drug trafficking cases. So I think there is just something, you know, about, uh, you know, how humans, how we respond to a terrorist threat, right? Um, we have this, you know, lone whole, lone wolf idea that's going. There's a provision in the Patriot Act that called the lone wolf provision wolf provision that has never been used. I mean, I think that the, my answer is yes. I think that there is going to be a time and there is going to be a reevaluation of all those laws. I think you saw that with the USA Freedom Act um, and with what the Patriot Act uh, ostensibly was being used for and, and to collect. So I think the answer is yes. And I think we're in that period of reevaluation and we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And Mark points out that a number of these laws already have sunsets built in the USA Patriot Act that passed right after 9-11 had sunsets built into it. Some of those things were made permanent. Some of them are still up, and, and part of this, uh, the 702 law has its own sunset. And so every few years, Congress comes back to it, decides we're revisited. In fact, what triggered really the 215 revisiting, besides the sort of uh, the leaks that came out and, and the like, were the fact that it was expiring and was going to go away completely. And so Congress needed to figure out a path forward. And so there are sunsets built into some of these laws that do help with that. And there's, of course, there's the ongoing question of when does the war on terror, if ever, end? 
right? Is it ever going to come to an end? The president has made clear, uh, President Obama has made clear that it's his view that it can and should come to an end and it should probably come to an end soon. Um, a, few, a couple of years ago, he said that he thinks we're, you know, we're, we're coming towards the end of that effort and it may be time to revise or repeal uh, the, the underlying authorization for the use of military force. Now, of course, things have changed since then. We've got ISIS. Um, and that entire conflict, this administration is now in an actual shooting war, albeit a limited one, uh, with ISIS. And so, you know, it, it's hard to know uh, when that terrorist threat goes away enough that the government could would be willing to give up some of its powers or that Congress decides it's important to set, it's time to take those powers away. But, of course, the risk is high, right? And it's, it's easy today for us to think about and to forget about how catastrophic and how deeply we all felt the 9-11 attacks, right? On the day those planes flew in those buildings and those buildings came down, I mean, the country was in complete shock. Um, 3,000 people, 3,000 plus people lost their lives that day. Um, and, you know, it, it's hard to remember that now, you know, 13 years removed from that. Um, but, you know, it, it, we'll, I think we'll just see. But I think, I think Mark is right that we're going through that process now. As we get further away from those catastrophic type attacks, I think it is, it is easier for people to think about how you might limit collection, how you might, um, how you might take steps to, uh, to, to, to do that. Of course, the challenge is, you know, if you don't make, if you make, if you don't put in place the, the right laws now, right, you run the risk that you legislate in a time of crisis. I bet most people in this audience probably don't think the USA Patriot is a good idea. That came because of a crisis, right? So as we're talking about things like going dark and encryption, I think it's important that we come together now before there's a terrorist attack or a or some sort of real problem where you're going to legislate in against a, a, a very tough background and get really bad laws. And so if you're looking to protect privacy, the time to act is now rather than waiting for the catastrophic event. Um, in the debate about this topic and even even here today, um, there's a lot of throwing around terms like national security threat or terrorism. And, you know, we, the art typical examples of ISIS or Al Qaeda, you know, gets brought to mind. But really, at least I think, this is being used much more broadly against, you know, peace activists, animal rights activists with just a camera. Uh, an Occupy Wall Street person, a whistleblower. Um, and the debate is so often about who, uh, you know, protecting against these real terrorist threats versus, you know, protecting privacy and very little about um, what is a legitimate terrorism threat and whether that's being overstepped. And, you know, we, we have a long history of overstepping that. And, uh, why doesn't that get more scrutiny? And is the FISA court in, in this new uh, scheme going to be considering that as well? So look, I mean, I think that you point out, you make a very good point, which is that this is actually what motivated the original FISA law, right, was these disclosures that the U.S. government was surveilling uh, domestic a activists, Martin Luther King Jr., right, Jane Fonda, right? That's what prompted these laws to restrict government surveillance back in the 1970s. Um, and so what, one thing that's notable about the Snowden disclosures is we haven't seen evidence of that in the Snowden disclosure, right? That there's, that there's broad surveillance of, of domestic political opposition or the like, or the, or the Nixon type activities in the current collection of prayers. We haven't seen that now. Doesn't mean it's not happening, right? Uh, from what I've seen inside the government, I don't see that happening, but you know, there's, there's certainly a possibility. The question you raise though is a good one, which is how broadly do, do you define these terms, terrorism, these terms of national security, and how they're being used, at least in the current way that what we've seen in the, in the, in the orders that have been disclosed by the FISA court, what the government's doing under 702 is going after foreigners overseas um, who present a foreign intelligence threat, right, spies and terrorists and the like, not domestic peace activists. And, and in fact, the 702 law, as we've, as we've been talking about a little bit, requires you to go get a federal court order, whether from a FISA court or from a criminal court, to surveil any Americans for any purpose. And so you'd have to find a belief that a crime is being committed. Now, there are domestic terrorism crimes. And it's the question of, well, you know, are these animal, animal rights activists, are they engaged in domestic terrorism? Remember back in the Back in the 80s, right, we remember the, uh, the sort of the attacks on the uh, Colorado ski resorts and the like that some activists engaged in. So is that terrorism? It seems, it seems not, but it's certainly a criminal act. And so that's a, that's a, that's a hard question. Yeah, I, you know, my response to that is we've seen a few things. Uh, we've seen that uh, a law firm, right, one of the law firms, I think, I forget which one, uh, the former NSA GC is now working for them, but they were spied upon uh, by these programs. I don't know if it was Section 702, but there was an exclusive, there was an exclusive report on how the programs were being used to spy on a law firm engaged in uh, trade negotiations on a given topic. Uh, the second thing is, we've seen 
profiles of an American. So, yeah, so wait, the, 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 an American law firm was targeted for surveillance. Yeah, yeah, but they didn't. It was under. It was unclear as if it was seven hundred two. Yeah, you should check. You should check it out. Uh, I can pull up Google right now. I believe it was like Williams Connolly. Williams Connolly. Um, it was. It was there. So that's been reported on. The second one are we have had profiles of Arab, Arab American activists being spied on. Um, again, the details on the article it's unclear if it's Section Seven Hundred Two or if there were in fact FISA nineteen seventy eight. You know, original FISA warrants so again, out for them. Yeah. So again, look, it's illegal. It's against the law explicitly to surveil Americans under the Seven Hundred Two program, no matter where they are in the world. It is illegal. So if the government's doing that, it's unlawful. It's unlawful under the statute that we passed in 2009, 2007, 2008. Um, number two, um, if there is a FISA court order just for surveillance of these, of these Americans, right, that's, that's what's required. That's what the law requires. It requires you to go to court, show probable cause, right, or in the case, that the person's a foreign intelligence uh, target or a foreign power agent of a foreign power. That's the law. That's the law Congress passed. Um, just like you would have to go in a criminal case to go to the court and get surveillance of an American and get a court order to surveil that person. So that's... Well, that's, that's the constitutional standard. Yeah, well, it's not that you can't well, surveil Americans. Well, well, it's that you have to get a warrant. But what we've seen is that with the 702, the incidental collection, people have been searched for, right, there are search They're terms not. in the collection that you get from Section 702, even if you were targeting the foreigners, that the DNI and NSA were searching the pile of communications for domestic, for U.S. identifiers, right? Oh, yeah, so, all yeah. incidental. So, okay, so, so, so this, is, this is a good point, yeah. So if you collect foreigners, if you collect, if you're collecting as a foreigner, right, and you want to see if an American is communicating with them, why would, you, why would you take that off the table? That doesn't make any sense. Well, the, you're not taking it off the table, but there should certainly be a higher legal standard. Right why? now, an analyst just looks at why, it. Why would, why would there be higher? If, if the collection was lawful, the collection was against somebody who did not have any Fourth Amendment rights, have no constitutional rights, right, and you're collecting against a foreigner located outside the United States, they have no rights under our Constitution, why should I be able to search that for anything? You've lawfully put the data. It's, it's like saying, oh, I've got, this file of, I've, got this, I've got this file of information, but I'm not going to go look through it because I'm going to put another well, then, process on top can of it. You can look through it yeah. as long as you get legal process, right? And not the legal but, process is not 702. The legal process when you're looking at or searching for a U.S. identifier should be right, a fourth but why? process. But why? You're not looking, you're not looking at American's data. No, no. We're you're not. Oh, and we're out of time. <laughs> but we will stick around. We'll tell you what. Yeah, if if people have more around. questions, we'll stick around outside. Feel free to come up, talk to us. We'd love to chat more. Thank you, guys. Yeah.